This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Okay, Ben, in the intro, and you said this now 240 times, (laughs) financial decision-making. So this week, we are talking specifically about a huge part of financial decision-making with an unreal guest, Professor Eric J. Johnson. So you might recall that name from back in episode 229 when we did a book review on the elements of choice that he wrote, Why the Way We Decide Matters. And we just had an incredible conversation with Eric to talk about how we are presented with the choice options or the choice architecture, how that impacts how you make a decision. And man, there were so many mind-blowing uh, observations and learnings from this conversation, which I mean, I know you agree because we talked about it, but like how we are presented with the options impacts how we decide. What do we need to know about who and what organization is deciding and what choices were presented? What can we do to learn about them to inform our decision? What are their incentives? Incredible. Yep. It's stuff that you like, if, you, if you've taken a market, marketing class, you kind of know you've scratched the surface at least yep. on this topic that, that y- you're, you're, you're affected by, by marketing, by how options are presented to you and how information is presented to you. But it's pretty mind blowing to hear the depth of that effect and the research that's been done on it uh, and on all of the different uh, elements of choice as the book is titled. Exactly. And he said his goal in writing that book was to, in, to, to create an awareness boost of choice architecture. And that is what we talked about today. So Professor Johnson is a professor of business and marketing at Columbia Business School. He's the director of the Center for Decision Sciences. He's earned a PhD in psychology from Carnegie Mellon University and was a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellow at Stanford. And his research is at the intersection of behavioral decision-making, economics, and the decision of the end user in making choices. He's also a contributor to Buy Side from the Wall Street Journal, and he writes about credit, credit cards, consumer finance, and consumer psychology. Yep, Uh, absolutely excellent conversation. Um, Like you said, lots of of mind-blowing bits and pieces. And, And one of the things that I was impressed with throughout the conversation is that Professor Johnson was very deliberate about linking because he knows the context of what our podcast is about. He was very deliberate about yeah. linking things back to financial decision making and investing. So I, I, I really appreciated that uh, extra effort to make his message applicable to our audience. Yeah, we kind of tripped over that at the end. We learned that he was a visiting scholar at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for a number of years. So yeah. he has great interest and insights into, into the world of finance. Well, I said to him afterwards, I was like, wow, you, you, you did a great job tying all this into <laughs> financial decision making. Uh, and then he told us that this is something that he's thought a lot about and has great interest in. Cool. Anything else, Ben, to add? No, uh, let's, let's go ahead to the episode. All right. Here's our conversation with Professor Eric J. Johnson. Professor Eric Johnson, welcome to the Rational Miter Podcast. Well, so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So every week in the intro, Ben says, this is a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making. So you're the perfect guest to to welcome to our show. Oh, thanks. So first off, how do you describe the hidden partner that accompanies us when we make decisions? So every time we make a decision, we don't realize it, but someone has been there before us. And that person who I'll call the designer, because that's a simple word, has actually made a bunch of decisions about how to present that decision to us. They've decided how many options. So this ranges from maybe a parent talking to a kid about going to bed or a CEO giving uh, direct reports, possible strategies. Somebody has already thought about how many options do I give somebody? What happens if they don't make a choice? What are the descriptions, the attributes of the options? There's a whole set of things that have already been chosen, decided by the designer. And in some way, the thing that's really important to realize is that will determine, at least in part, 
what gets chosen. So for example, if I decide not to present an option to you, you're not, not likely to choose it. It's as simple as that. So the designer has a lot more influence than we as, as people who make decisions and they as designers appreciate. Hmm. How, how significant is the effect of those design choices on the decisions that we ultimately make? In some cases, particularly when the decision is infrequent and one we're not sure of, it can be huge. Um, I think the, one of the world's records is held by um, a study done in Switzerland with real utility customers. And they were told you can either choose the green electricity, the one that's generated by, in their case, hydro and solar, but mostly hydro, or gray or black electricity, which is made by coal. And the green's a little bit more expensive. It turns out all they did was pre-check one box. So you could make either choice, but you just had to move that check. And they found about a 90% difference in what people chose. Wow. And what's interesting is you think, well, maybe the first time it works, but they fool people. Something like 85% of people stick with that initial choice. There are lots wow. of examples, but that's the sense of particularly things you don't think about your electricity choices that often. No. So it's going to have a bigger effect than it would be if you're talking about, do I want to eat liver or not? Mm. What are plausible paths and how do we choose them? So one of the things that's, you know, I've been thinking a lot about is how these design decisions, the choice architecture, what the how it actually works. And one of the things it does, it actually directs our attention to one thing or the other, or certain aspects. And so the path I think about, it's almost like going in a supermarket, you're choosing a path to go and buy groceries. Well, the path here is how, what information I'm gonna look at to make this choice. And the information that's easy to look at, that for some reason is first on a list or is in bright red, or for whatever reason that's easier to look at, tends to get more weight. So the plausible path is essentially what is the information you look at? And probably more importantly, what is the information you ignore? If you, let me just give you one example. Remember the old school, since we're talking about investing, old school newspapers where you would have literally thousands of securities listed. You're, you're obviously not gonna look at all of them. So you would look at ones that are first in the category or ones that you you know where they are because you've invested in them you're going to look at a very small subset and i think that's true of most decisions we look at only a bit of the information mm -hmm. and we look at the information that's typically is easiest for us to see to read to process hmm. yeah no that, that's that's really interesting so do, do you think people are generally or how how aware do you think people are generally of all of the options that are available to them when they're making a decision. I, I depends, of course, on the decision. You'll hear me say that more than once because it's not one size fits all. But you know, often the ones that are in front of you, as opposed to the ones that you have to invent. So let's go to lunch, and you, Cameron and, and Ben sort of start talking about this, and Cameron says, "Oh, I know there's X, Y, and Z." You'll probably end up at X, Y, or Z, and not a you know the great taco place that Benjamin had just forgotten about because he's already thinking about Cameron's choices, even if they might be great or, or maybe lame. I don't know, Cameron, do you have good taste in restaurants? Sometimes. Okay. So, <laughs> but I don't remember them all. It's a, it's a very good example. Yeah. Cause yeah. often you'll go and say, Oh, I wish we'd remember some other place. That's right. Or you're walking down the street in the way and go, Oh, we could have gone. Or yeah. maybe you decide to go to someplace. But the reality in life is that we don't have time or perhaps the recall to be able to expand those options as we make decisions. No, I, I mean, I think there, there is a lot of power in actually keeping a list. So I think we all have this problem with um, what we should be streaming. I mean, yeah, we all sit there when it comes time to actually Friday night to sit down and figure out what to stream. You go, oh, there was, what was the name of that movie again? So I purposely keep a long list of things that people recommend. And I may not like some of them, but at least they are considered. So how do you do that practically speaking? So if we have a recall issue, do, do you have you know tactics to, is, is it simply to make a list, but we can't have lists for everything that we have to decide to do. 
So that's absolutely right. And, you know, decisions have come in all sizes from, you know, do I eat, do, do I eat another bowl of chips to, you know, who do I marry? So there are all sorts of decisions. But for really important decisions, it turns out Ben Franklin, of all people, had an amazingly good advice. Um, it turns out that many people have quote, looked at this quote and they missed something really important. Franklin, it turns out, said to a friend who was trying to decide whether or not to take a job, um, what you should do is, is write down the two options, take job X, take job Y, work for, it was uh, pastor something or work for the government and write down the pluses and minuses of each. But what Franklin said, which is interesting, he said, then go away for a day, come back and see if anything else comes to mind. Because right. not only do we not think of particular options, you forget about the taco restaurant, but you also think about different characteristics. So it's, you know, it turned out in this case, perhaps the person forgot that, you know, living in this little village was much more attractive than living in the big city. But that didn't come to mind at first. So basically, the point of writing things down isn't as much remembering what you're going to remember then, but being able to think about other things later. And then Franklin had a pretty simple idea, which is basically count the number of positives and minuses and pick the one that wins. I'm not sure that's exactly the right rule. You might want to weight them a little bit, but at least there, everything is out. And it's, it's, it's not something that you're going to um, say, oh, I wish I thought about, you know, something else, the old commercial, I should have had a V8. <laughs> so on that concept of, of memory and recall, how, how impactful do you think recent events are to a decision that's being made? That's a really, really nice question because I think much more than we realize because we're not thinking about what we're not thinking of. Right. Um, it's, it's very difficult. And so often these things are things that we're not aware we're influenced by. There's a, I came across in, in doing research, a great example of college choice. And I think college choice is really important. Um, and it is, um, but it turns out colleges who have successful sports programs get a lot more applications in years they do well. So it's gonna be a tough year to get into mm -hmm. Georgia, I'm afraid. Um, my favorite example of this though is, uh, Boston College had a quarterback named Doug Flutie who had this miraculous throw to win to win a bowl game, their applications went up 70% that year. Wow. It's not that, you know, it became, you know, a much better school academically. It probably didn't even become a much better school as a party school, but now people remembered it. And I suspect if you ask people, did Doug Flutie cause you to apply to Boston college? They would say no. Yeah, that is a, that is a crazy example to think about. That's, um, we looked at a paper a while ago I think it was a Brad Barber paper um, on uh, attention and stock buying, where where stocks that are in the media people tend to tend to buy more frequently. Yeah, you know my favorite example of, of that, which I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, is that at the beginning of the pandemic, there were two stocks um, that shared the same name, Zoom. One is the one that we're using to talk to right. each other. The other was a essentially defunct digital uh, company. And they both just saw big increases in prices. Yeah. I'm curious of your perspective on this. How much effort are people typically willing to spend in making a decision? You know, it, it's hard to say, again, generally, because there are all sorts of decisions. The question might be thought about slightly differently, which is how much are people spending the right amount of effort for every decision? Mm. Right. Some decisions are unimportant. You know, do I have a second bowl of chips um, or others are much more important. Um, and the question is basically, are people putting the right effort in for each decision? You shouldn't be spending a lot of time thinking about chips. In fact, if you're smart, you've done your own choice architecture. Yep. Um, a piece of advice that, that uh, I really believe in is you never eat out of the bag of chips because you're not never gonna have to make a decision about when to stop. But if you put them in a bowl and then bring the bowl to you, to you, then you have to actually make the decision. It's a way of making a decision that you wouldn't make because it's automatic to keep, you know, yep. eating the port of ice cream or the huge bag of chips. Um, 
and instead they say, I'm going to decide now to make a decision again when I'm done you know, with, with this small bowl. And so I think a lot of it is, is structuring it so that you make the right, you spend the right amount of effort making a decision. Yeah, that sounds like that sounds like changing your environment a little bit too to to influence future decisions. Yeah, it's actually a great example of being your own choice architect. Mm. Yeah, that's a that's a really nice way to to frame it. Uh, on that concept of effort in a decision, what affects the amount of effort that people feel they need to exert to make a decision? And I and I one of the things that made me want to ask that question is in your book. You talk about fonts and fonts affecting the amount of the, the, the feeling of ease in, in making decisions. That was just like mind blowing. Anyway, so on, on with the question. It's a, it's a good example though, because you don't think of fonts as being something that you think a lot about. You sort of say it's pretty or it's ugly, but it turns out fonts determine a lot about how hard you have to work to understand, um, understand the information. There are some truly awful fonts um, there. And uh, I think the one that I really think is one of the ugliest is, is called Hotenschweller, and I'm not doing a, a good job of pronouncing it because it's not only hard to read, it's also hard to pronounce. <laughs> but what is true of that font is you will work very hard and then get tired and not work, and give up faster. That I think there are lots of cases where even small changes in our own research of a few hundred milliseconds, a millisecond is a thousandth of a second, will change the way people the plausible path that people use. So, you know, I, I think the way of putting it is, is it's not that we're lazy, we're just really sensitive to cost, particularly up front. Mm. You know, we know people get obsessed with decisions, you know, that, that happens too. But when it comes to starting a decision, we're going to make a decision about how to decide very quickly at the beginning of the decision. And that will, you know, have an influence. So what, what, what else could go in there? Like, like we talked about fonts as a, as a super interesting example, but what else can affect the sense of ease when you're... So, uh, so there's a, a couple of nice examples. One is if you think about brand names or even I think uh, in the world of investing, ticker symbols. Hmm. Some are going to be very hard. You know, XQYZ is probably not if ticker symbol you're going to remember easily. Um, you know, companies that have names that are obscure and hard to understand, you know, we're getting into the world of branding now, but that's part of it is what, we, you know, we think about as fluency, the subjective ease of, of these things. So those are two great examples. Um, imagine you're writing out numbers in words. So I could write out the word 1,963. That's a lot harder to read than putting one, the digit 1963. Mm. Um, so there's lots of things, number of digits, just Put a decimal point in one nine six three and add four more numbers. You're not, it's there's a good strategy. Just ignore everything to the right of the decimal point. Uh, but you're not going to adopt that. You're going to say, "Oh, that's that gives me a headache." There's another interesting one I read in the news lately about Kia that did a rebrand, and their new logo looks to many people like K N. So apparently, the search for K N soared on Google because because people didn't know what this new logo was. Can you imagine a company of that scale and magnitude having that hmm. kind of, I guess, potential blunder? You wonder how that decision got made. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so you mentioned lazy. How important are default choices in determining what we do ultimately choose? So defaults are something that, you know, I, I find very interesting because they essentially are what happens when you don't make an active choice. Um, you know, for many years in investing, the default was you save no money from your salary. Um, and that was changed in 1996. The Department of Labor and Congress passed enabling legislation to let people and companies default people into more than that. Uh, so defaults can be, that would have been another example of huge choice architecture, architecture consequences. But defaults work in part because we're lazy. Now, what's interesting is actually changing the default for your savings wouldn't be that hard. You have to go to a website and you have to decide to go from zero to three or five or seven percent. Nobody does that. And I think that's partly because although it doesn't take much time, we really don't feel we're very expert at that. 
you know, as soon as we actually try and make that decision, we sort of realize there's a lot we don't know. Um, there's more than that going on, but that's part of what's going on. So defaults, what happens when you don't make a choice can have a big impact. Now, there's lots of other things that influence defaults. Um, the thing that I'm uh, perhaps immodestly, say, most famous for is work we did with organ donation. What happens mm. to your organs after um, you, you pass away? And we, uh, Dan Goldstein and I uh, started looking at different European countries. And it turns out some countries, you're a donor by default. You have to just check a box to become not a donor. In other countries, you are a donor. You are not a donor unless you choose a box. And it turns out when you start looking at the data, there are huge effects. That might be another world's record. Um, but you know there are 70% differences in the number of people willing to be a donor. Um, and you know we argue that that actually results in additional transplants occurring in those countries that actually have the default. And since we did that research, um, one of the things that's true is the number of countries have changed defaults. Now, I'm not sure they do the whole package. There are lots of steps like families that are involved. So some of my friends like Richard Thaler would say, but you also need to get the family to know that I made a decision. And I think that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. But the default is one important part along the way of, of deciding to be a donor. You talked about laziness. What other effects drive the influence of defaults on decisions? So let's go back to the example of deciding how much to save. If your company starts defaulting you into 5%, you might think the company thinks that's a good idea, that the company is endorsing that as the right level of, of um, savings. So I think endorsement, we actually have a cute three E's. There's there's essentially ease being lazy, be, avoiding uh, work or be, being lazy, endorsement. And the last one is sort of endowment, that when I actually have something that's defaulted, I think about it as if I own it. And for those uh, listeners who've read um, books by uh, people like Kahneman and Thaler, they'll recognize the endowment effect, that people value a mug much more when they own it than if they don't own it. And it's because we would argue memory plays a big role. I think about all the good things about the mug. Well, defaults are that way. I might think about all the good outcomes if I were a donor. So it's ease, uh, endorsement, and endowment, I think. So one of the reasons defaults give you such big effects, we argue, is because all these things work in the same way. What's going on in the mind of the decision maker? Is it laziness? Is it trust like you just believe in what's being presented to you I, I mean i think you can tease them apart if you're a compulsive psychologist who wants to show that all three have separate effects um but i think in most settings you do the same so if i say give you a default and the default set by some not very reputable marketer i think we can say oh trust or endorsement might go the other way oh if they want me to 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 have express shipping, I'm gonna uncheck that box. So they're, they're potentially separable, but most of them are going on at the same time in the same direction. So interesting. Oh, it is. So we've got these three powerful effects, ease, endorsement, and endowment. How does the designer of the default know that they're making the right default choice for the user? That's important for defaults it's important as well for all choice architecture mm. because let's just you know let's talk about order uh i'll simplify for a second this is almost true but being first is usually good so then how do i know which is the right first option to present you mm -hmm. and that's a really challenging question i i talk about it quite a bit and i one thing i think about is sometimes you can tell it because people change their mind after they've made the choice they go, oh gosh, what was I thinking? Hmm. So there's consistency, which is a large part of what people have done. Or you can do a sensitivity analysis. I put um, the cranberry juice first and the orange juice first and people pick whatever is first. Then I know there's not a strong preference. So there's those. But you know, my favorite technique is what I sometimes call the decision simulator idea, which is I tell you that you want to, let's 
say, buy a, a mutual fund that has low costs, high returns, and um, and a very broad market exposure. I then give you a set of funds. What I know is a good choice if you find the one I've told you to look for. Mm. Just like a flight simulator, you, you know the pilot's doing well if they land the plane in Charles de Gaulle Airport. You say, okay, then that's a good a cockpit. You know, the same thing happens there. If they can find an option, they're actually able to make a better choice. So controlling for preferences in a way by telling people what they're looking for. And that's something we've used in lots of contexts like credit card choice. You know, you're going to be carrying a $5,000 balance. You care about points, find the right credit card. That allows us to sort of see what about the choice architecture helps people make find the right choice for them. Hmm. So interesting. Uh, what is the optimal optimal number or is there an optimal number of options to present for a choice? I would love, you know, I'm going off in a little while and teaching my MBA students. They would love it if I could say five. <laughs> they would love it if there was a simple answer. And, uh, you know, the part of me that's going to disappoint my students tonight is when I say it depends. But I'm going to be a little bit better than that and just saying, what are the things it depends on? Um, one thing that's true is two things happen. As I add more options, I make the choice harder. You have to look at more and more, and people are more likely to give up or choose randomly. That Those are bad things. But it also happens <clears throat> is that I add variety to the choice set. So, you know, you don't, maybe you want to go to a restaurant that serves only hamburgers, particularly if you know in advance that's where you want to go. But in all likelihood, you want two or three or four or five options. You know, so basically you can have variety. Um, it can be a huge mistake. So the New York school system gives kids choosing high schools a book. Literally until recently, it was a book that looked like an old school telephone directory. And that telephone directory had 769 different high schools for them to choose from. And as you might guess, this is not pretty and lots of kids make terrible choices. Um, so that's wrong. But the reason they give you a lot, because there's a lot of variety in, in schools. There's Votech schools, there's college prep schools, there are schools that specialize in aviation. You know, so they want people to have those choices, but they're going too far, obviously, and people are overwhelmed. So I won't, sorry, I won't say five, but I'll say that, you know, there, if you can figure out these factors, you want to give people enough variety and at the same time not overwhelm them. You're going to get closer to the truth than putting everything in the, in the in the book that I think weighs three point five pounds. Yeah, that is that is wild. Uh, if you were evaluating that decision architecture, how would you determine that too many options have been presented? I mean, the the phone book example is obvious, but how how else would you evaluate that? So one thing is sort of going back to the notion of decision simulator. Imagine I took a kid and said. You're going to look for a college prep school that's 30 minutes away for less than 30 minutes away from you that has um, a good marching band, whatever it is. Can they find it in that mm -hmm. list? And with 792 or 769, it's going to take them a long time or they won't find it at all. Another mm -hmm. thing is we know some things matter, like we know that travel distance matters. So maybe what we should do, and researchers have done this, we sort of limit schools within a half hour commuting distance or and this is really important what they did is there are schools that are truly bad it's a sad comment on the new york city school system there are schools that have less than seven percent of all students graduate wow so it probably is not a bad idea of just eliminating those schools from the list so truly bad options including options that are just worse on every way um are things you want to eliminate. So there are mm. ways of actually winnowing the the choice set to make it easier for the person without really much loss. So are you basically saying, Eric, that you're letting the chooser decide the architecture? Like proximity matters, university prep matters, music matters. That would be wonderful. And we can do that now. I mean, so a term that I borrowed is the notion of a choice engine. And that is the idea that people actually can 
on a website, particularly, although salespeople do this too, on a website actually sort of redefine the options. So you can say, um, I, you know, to use Amazon, I only want things that are prime that we'll get here in a day. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's an example. So yes, ideally you can, you can do that. Now, what's sort of an unknown question is how well, how much that helps people, but certainly with technology now, we can let people make their own choice sets smaller or rank order by something. One thing that is true, by the way, is that if I sort by an attribute, let's say the classic study is, has wine and it's using either price or quality, and you can sort by that. Whatever you sort by turns out to be more important. Mm -hmm. So if you sort by price, you're more likely to have two buck chuck. Um, and if you sort by quality, I don't know, insert the name of your favorite expensive wine here. But there's an influence of that sorting on what people choose. Do you think people will feel better about that decision if they were part of creating the architecture? It's a great question. And it's, um, you know, I think we don't know the answer fully. Uh, the thing we know even less, I suspect they do, we know less is are they making better choices? You know, maybe the people who are, who are buying the two buck truck are actually not getting the wine that's best for them. We don't know that. It's, it's one of the nice things about the study of decision making and, and choice architecture is they're still unanswered questions. Fascinating. Huh. You touched on this briefly, but I want to dig into it a little bit more. What effect does the order of options being presented have on decisions? Yeah, so I, I want, I'm glad you're asking that question. So I didn't want to leave people with the idea that first is always the best. And let me give you an example, um, which is in written lists where you have control, it's probably a good idea to be first because you know someone's going to stop probably too soon. Um, you know, there are electoral uh, ballots that have, you know, 19 or 20 presidential candidates. I was talking to an interviewer. There are nine mayoral candidates in Chicago right now. That's probably going to give whoever's first in that list a big advantage. Hmm. Um, some studies have shown that basically the first person on that list of, uh, on a ballot gets a one or two percent increase in vote share. Well, look at Bush Gore, right? That's a, the perfect example of that is when some states, and Ohio turns out to be one of them, they actually randomize the order. They think it matters. And when they did, whoever was first on the list got a 2% boost. And in Florida, of course, which was where it all came down to in Bush Gore, um, it wasn't nepotism. It just the Republican governor who happened to be Jeb Bush put the other Republican presidential candidate, his brother George, first on the ballot. They do the Democrats would do the same thing, but being first on the ballot because it's a written list makes a difference. Hmm. I didn't know that. So that was his choice. That wasn't some rule like alphabetical or they don't have. I mean, it, it turns out different states have different rules, different procedures. So I, I'm not trying to say that Jeb said we're going to make George first, but Jeb being a Republican, but the wow. you know didn't I don't know if he even actually was a conscious decision on his part uh, just to be fair I have to tell you something I found out when I was doing research is in Delaware Joe Biden's home state the Democrat is always first hmm. in other states like Massachusetts the incumbent is always first isn't that interesting and so yeah, wow. un unknowingly um I suspect people are making decisions about order that will have an influence that they don't realize will happen. So that is choice architecture. That's exactly right. And so defaults are nice. They're the poster child for choice yeah. architecture in lots of ways. But even things like order can have a big influence. How does the way that options are described affect what people choose? So, you know, think about this. Um, when I have to describe cost or nutrition or gas mileage, I actually have a lot of flexibility in how I describe that. Um, one of the things I've been interested in lately is energy efficiency. And you can use, let's go over some of the scales you can use. I could tell you something boring, like this uses a certain number of kilowatt hours per year. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of knowledge of what that is. I can also present that in terms of dollars. 
Now, the problem is I need to know something about your used to do that, but I could say this one's cost $30 a year to run. The other dishwasher costs $50 a year. And that's going to help you decide trade-off price versus efficiency. Other places use traffic light scales. Other places use letters. You get an A if you're the most efficient, B, C, and D, and Fs. Um, it turns out that the, the, as appliances get better in certain European countries, the scale has not changed. What they've done is added extra grades. They've had grade inflation. So the really efficient appliances now are A plus or A plus plus or A plus plus plus. Now, the point is all these different ways of describing the attribute of energy efficiency make it easy to do some things like trading off versus price or easy to rank. Obviously, the A plus 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 is more efficient than the D. So they actually have an impact. Um, and again, it's a design decision that the designer makes, perhaps knowingly, perhaps unknowingly, that's going to influence what the chooser chooses. I just want to come back to the order order for a second. As you're talking about that, I was thinking about, um, we, we looked at research on Robinhood a while ago, and they had their list of top top stocks or whatever. That, that must have had a, and we know it did empirically, but based on what you're saying, it, it makes sense why, I guess, that would have such a massive influence on the decisions people were making. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, Robin Hood's, it was a very interesting example of a choice engine, choice architecture. Um, and one of the things that is clear is by doing some things like having confetti when you made a trade, yeah. not a good trade, not a bad trade, a trade, they encouraged trading. They also took what was the trade price and made it appear to be zero mm. because they were making their money, as you know, order flow for payment. Yep, yep. So it's it's actually a, a, a nice example of a choice engine that, you know, in my opinion, wasn't necessarily in customers' best interest all all the time. Yeah, that was a that, that was a, a messy one. Yeah, I, we actually have just written a case for my course this year on Robinhood. Um, it's all, what's interesting about cases like that is how quickly things are changing. Yeah. Right. How, how does the uh, the exponential growth bias influence long-term decisions? Mm. Well, I mean, I think it's really important for investing, particularly, um, and borrowing money. So um, the bottom line, the simple version of it is people don't do exponential arithmetic well. And of course, that's what you really need to be able to do to evaluate borrowing and to evaluate investing. And so I do, um, with students, I give them the following problem. Imagine you had ten thousand dollars and you're twenty, and you're getting a ten percent real rate of return. Now, before anyone asks, this is a hypothetical. Uh, but I, I would, and I would buy a lot of whatever it was that got me a ten percent real rate of return. But what I simply do is say, okay, this is tax free. It's like a Roth that you don't. Get. Well, how much will you have at 65, 35 years down the road? Almost everybody underestimates. In fact, most people. I will say about $100,000, when in reality, the answer is over $700,000. Now, this right. isn't just about getting it wrong, and it's not about getting it wrong by be underestimating the impact of, of exponential growth, but it's, that means you're going to underappreciate the value of savings. Now, if we flip that for a second and talk about your borrowing money, absolutely, it's going to go the opposite way. You're going to underappreciate the cost mm. of borrowing. So it actually leads to systematic mistakes, both among investors, they underinvest, and borrows, they borrow too much money. Obvious question, what can we as advisors do to help people understand that? Well, I think one way of doing it is actually to do something that's really simple, and that is to sort of say, here's how much money you would have. You know, it's one thing to say, here's the interest rate. There's another thing to say that after 10 years, you know, this is what you expect now. As advisors, you're going to say, but there's lots of uncertainty in the market. Yeah. But of course, we can talk about that. You know, this is the median return. It could be as high as this or as low as that. Um, you know, I think very enlightened firms actually show you the 
growth path with both upper and lower expectations, you know, statistics, almost like statistical bounds. And they use Monte Carlo simulation to find yep. that out. But that's much better than saying it, it, you know, the historical returns have been 6% when people don't know what that means. Because to really understand that percentage, you have to understand what the time frame is. Mm. And we don't do that math well. Mm. We, we talked to um, Professor Robert Merton recently, and one of the things that he's been really advocating for is getting, what he wants to see is financial institutions reporting uh, accounts in terms of the income that they will produce instead of the asset, because that takes away a lot of the issues that we're talking about, makes it easier for people to understand. Yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, it's, it's interesting. One of the few investments that does that is annuities. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my retirement savings. And the other thing is, and this has been shown by some other, other, other folks, um, uh, Dan Goldstein my, um, and Hal Hirschfield and others, is that if you give people, tell them, here's your total um, savings, people underestimate, or sorry, overestimate how long that will last. Mm. You know, I have a million dollars in the bank. Well, yeah, but start taking 50,000 out of that every year. You're, it's going to disappear quickly. So I think, I, I think um, Merton's exactly right. And same yeah. thing for loans. You know, after after, after five years, that car, you're going to be paying an extra twelve hundred dollars to borrow the money for that car. Mm. Yep. I'm going to make a guess that possibly the choice engine that impacts right now the most listeners is the Netflix landing page. <laughs> How much influence does a well-designed choice engine like that have on what people choose? Um, I think enormously, one answer is Netflix runs dozens of experiments a week trying to get that web page to be as good for them as possible. Now, good for them, I want to say, is what do they want? They want you to watch more Netflix they want you to want more Netflix that's less expensive for them to rent. Oh, so remember, Net, Netflix is trying to get you to watch, but the um, my darling wife loved the series The Crown, and that is very expensive, tens of millions of dollars an episode for Netflix to produce. So after she was done one season, they started suggesting Downton Abbey, which was an old show from 10 years ago which actually she liked. And so they got her to watch something like 60 hours of Downton Abbey. And they, that was so much less expensive for them than producing The Crown. So that's what Netflix is trying to do. That's the first thing is it's, they're trying to get you to watch something, but con constrained on that it's not terribly expensive. Um, the other thing is they do, I said they do a lot of experiments. They experiment on things like the pictures that they show on the landing page. Yeah. They actually see what are the pictures that are most likely to get somebody to click through and watch that show. Wow. Is there a lesson in there for people making a choice to try to be more aware of the incentives of the choice architect? Well, I think, uh, let me step back and say, even being aware that there is a choice architecture mm -hmm. is, is the, the first lesson. Because normally we're just too busy making a choice to actually think about how the choice architecture has an influence. Wow. So that's the, I mean, if you ask people, for example, with defaults, people have done the study, were you influenced by the fact that box was pre-checked? They'll say, I wasn't, maybe other people, but not wow. me. Wow. So one of the things that's really quite true is that, you know, yes, you should think about how the designer is trying to influence you, but you should just think about how the choice architecture itself has an influence because not all designers are as savvy about choice architecture as you might think. Um, lots of people underestimate the power they have as designers, but even, and even those people are having an influence on you, but it's particularly true. There are obviously people who particularly in, in technology and web-based businesses where you can do experiments to see what the impact is. And that's where, they know very much how to optimize from their perspective, your choices. What role can a choice engine play in educating its users? Uh, 
and I'll tack on, I don't like doing two part questions, but how can that go wrong? Um, so, you know, I, I, in thinking about this a lot, I ended up th thinking Robin Hood missed a big opportunity. They had this huge influx of new investors. Um, and they had the opportunity to actually influence and they have changed. I've, I've you know, they've have list, responded to some of the critique, but a large part is their ability, their, their content for educating uh, all these newbie investors was not particularly good. Mm. Their explanation of options, which aren't a simple concept, was sort of lacking. Um, so I, I think it's the case that um, there, there's a lot of opportunity. You can increase someone's comprehension. Look, we don't all have a salesperson who can ha you know, guide us through every decision, but there's certainly the ability to have more information there about how to make the choice or what the attributes mean. Um, and so that's very important. So think about the job Amazon has. Amazon has a choice engine that could educate you. They also do something which I think people don't realize has an influence. They are now selling position on the website and that's become a very big source of revenue for them. So there's a tension, right? Between things that are profitable and, and educating people. And the hard part really to think about is there, you can be torn because you want people to make better decisions long-term, but if they're not aware of the impact of choice architecture, it's very hard to get them to appreciate that. So it's actually a, a challenge for managers, even well-intentioned ones, to understand you know, how can you get the choice architecture to help people and, and for them to realize it. Wow. You have to think people at the time that they're making a decision would be particularly receptive to education. Oh, I think just in time education is a way to think about this, particularly mm. in financial services oh, wow. is super important. Um, you know, how often do you go shopping for a mortgage? Right. And how pleasant an experience is that? I think the answer is not very often and it's not very pleasant. Um, but that's a place where, you know, having some explanation of what it, do points mean? What should I be thinking about if I think about points? It's not rocket science. Um, so I think there, there, there is a lot of value to doing that in terms of improving uh, outcomes. Uh, we spent a lot of time last year talking about the impact of social media on people's attentions. Do you have thoughts around the opportunity that the large social media companies might have to educate perhaps just in time as people are consuming these feeds from the various sources? Oh, that's a very uh, interesting and, and tough question. I mean, clearly, I think we're starting to understand um, how people can be taught to evaluate um, social media, you know, the, and, but that's an area that is just starting and it's not I'm not super expert, but it's clear that people can be taught to evaluate messages critically and not just accept things. And that seems to make it some of a difference. Um, mm -hmm. There was a very nice article in the New York Times today about Finland as having one of the most computer literate populations because in schools, they actually teach kids to be critical of, of the TikToks they're watching asking a simple question, sort of like Cameron's point earlier, why is the person producing this message producing it? Sort of going one level beyond saying, why is the choice architect presenting things this way? There's also uh, a function of time. Like I saw a news story this morning that I think the average TikTok user, I think it's well over an hour and a half per day on average. And there's over a billion users. Like just the choice to spend that much time or not is interesting. It's very interesting. I think it's a good example of a choice. It's pretty automatic, right? No one sits down and says, I'm going to spend an hour doing TikTok. I, I love the idea of not just asking about, asking yourself about incentives, but asking about choice architecture. And I'd loved your point earlier that, that the choice architect may not have thought things out that well. So it's even asking about incentives may not be the right thing to do. I think that's or that's right. I mean, you know, uh, my wife also does decision making research and kiddingly students say, 
do you guys do choice architecture against each other? <laughs> and I have to say, no, most of the time we're too tired. <laughs> that is funny. Um, so we're talking about how, how to make better decisions. And we're talking about how that fit, how choice architecture fits into that. How does a good decision account for the fact that due to uncertainty in real life, you can still get a bad outcome? You know, I mean, I think acknowledging that is the first step saying, you know, if I had a good process and a bad outcome, um, one of the real questions is how do I decide whether this process is a good process or, mm. and one of the ways to think about that is, uh, you know, for example, example I use a lot is hiring people. You know, I'm going to make bad hires sometimes. Um, but on average, does this process you know, do better than the alternative, let's say, of random choice? Mm. And it's only by looking at, or on a slightly broader view, what Danny Kahneman calls the outside view, th that you can actually see that this process is doing better. But it's mm. really hard. I mean, it's really hard to think that way. I mean, mm. you say, oh, I, I chose that person this way and they were great. I'm a genius. There was a yeah. review of your book that I came across that said, absolute free will is an illusion. I thought that was interesting. Do you agree with that? Um, I, I don't think the book claims that. I do think to say that free will is the only thing that determines our choices is wrong. Um, you know, there, there is a mix. The environment does make a difference. Um, and because of that, you know, to the notion that I, cho I mean, we are wired to believe in free will, right? Because in lots of ways, we're aware of the contents of what we're thinking when we're making a choice. We're not aware that that is influenced by the way the options are presented. Um, and so I think we tend to overestimate the impact of our free will. Um, but that's not to say, so yeah, if you want to say absolute free will, I'm not sure that exists. We live in a cultural milieu. That culture, excuse the big word, but basically the culture determines what options we see. Um, you know, I grew up in a working class New Jersey suburb. Um, not many people are going to go to college. For most people, the set of options didn't include college. Right. You know, now was it, uh, yes, I expressed free will by going to college, but it's not that the, uh, the other folks expressed free will by not going to college, it's just the option set was limited for many people. Yeah, the the discussion of free will in your book is is uh, is fascinating. Um, I learn an awful lot by by you know reading. Philosophers are 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 even they are unsure about whether free will exists or if it's an illusion, a useful illusion. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what the you can't help but think that the whole time that you're reading your your book in in particular that it's like. <laughs> How much of the decisions that you made in the past were, were really your own decisions versus because you, you don't realize this stuff. You know, like you said earlier, you, you, people may not even realize that there was a choice architect. No, and I, I, I think, you know, the, the lesson perhaps to learn is just to try and be aware of it. And if you want to, if there is a piece of advice that I think is useful, if you do worry about choice architecture, is try making the choice differently. So instead of sorting or starting at the top, start at the bottom of the list and see if you make the same choice. You can do sort of a sensitivity analysis, you know, sort of it's not using Excel, but just say, well, let's see if I looked at this attribute first, would that do the same thing, you know? And if you end up making the same choice, it's pretty robust. But if like you end that. up thinking very differently about the world, um, you know, I, th I think that it says, maybe I don't know exactly what it is I want. Hmm. So from the perspective of the decision maker, throughout our conversation, we've talked about a couple of things, B being aware of the fact that there was a decision architect, maybe being aware of the incentives that they had, uh, and then doing a sensitivity analysis. Is there anything else that you think people should do to, to minimize the influence of choice architecture? You know, my goal was to do a awareness boost in writing the book. Um, and, you know, I've, I've thought a little bit ab about, you know, what someone can do to do things better. But the goal of the book really is to help us all because we're oh. all choice architects. So something that, you know, we haven't talked about much 
is the fact that we are choice architects every day of our lives. We obviously make choices, but you present choices to lots of people. Um, you know, financial advisors, as you know, you're well aware, have a big influence. And if they're aware of that, maybe they can do a better job of giving advice. Yeah, in your book, you refer to financial advisors as living, breathing choice architecture. Um, but you also cite a study in there showing that they have, there's mystery shoppers. This is a great study. I went and read it after after you, I saw it in your book. Uh, and and bas- basically, the advisors in the in the paper were not giving very good advice. Uh, what do you think financial advisors can be doing to be most useful to their clients? Um, it's actually you know that's a whole nother book um, in <laughs> lots of ways. But I think. One question is, is the question of, are you a fiduciary or not? Right. I can barely pronounce that word, but I'm, and I'm not an expert, but basically in whose best interest are you operating? And right. of course that would be a simple way of, a of, of, a someone looking for advice to actually understand that not everybody is necessarily get, even getting compensated by what's best for you. Um, so I think that's, that's the first question. Then there are lots of tools. You know, I, if I wanted to sell you, let's let's ask the question. So I want to sell you a bad investment for you, but I'd give you lots of options. I would position the one I want first. Oh, the one thing we should say is when you, the list is given verbally, first is not always the best because people forget the first thing on the list. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. So this is one one of the things. It's another thing where I'd like it to say, First is always best, and you know that would be one of Johnson's laws. But the reality is that memory plays a role. So if you're at a fancy restaurant, they're reading an oral menu, you know you forget what's early on in that, that list. So if I were this uh, financial advisor who was trying to sell me a bad product, I'd make sure the bad product is at the end, toward the end of the list, so I remember it. And there's a set of things I, I could do to do that. So choice architecture would be doing these choice architecture right is something that I think hopefully what I've written will help advisors do a better job. Well, I mean, yeah. But before reading your book, I don't know if I had heard heard the term choice architecture or not. I probably had in passing, but I hadn't spent a whole lot of a, a ton of time thinking about it. I mean, you when you go on Netflix, you you can't help but feel like the you know, you know, you know that they're positioning things a certain way. Um, anyway, I, I had not thought about it at near the level of detail that you've written about it in. So that was for me personally, very, very useful. And if there's something that uh, I want, want to remind people is there's a great default example, which is on Netflix, um, the autoplay option is the default. Right. So if you wait too long, you'll start hearing blaring of one of the the movies or TV series that are there. If you go somewhere in the bowels of the machine, you can turn that off. Mm. Most people, I would argue, want that off. And right. they, they've made it a little bit harder than I, I, I would like to turn that off. So that's, that's a good example. And the reason is, of course, when you hear, you start hearing the audio from and video from a, a movie, you're more likely to continue watching it. I have another follow-up question on the financial advisor. I'm not sure if I'm going to word this properly, but if you're trying to decide where to go for advice and you look at the industry, there's so many options and many people don't have the competency to decide in a perfect world what is truly best for them. And we have an industry that's that in, in many cases is promoting active stock picking, as an example, where an industry largely grew up in that area. Do you have a, a recommendation for people when they have to make a choice that big, that broad? Like, how do you tackle this so one thing of course is to understand the incentives of the advisor um and so one of the reasons active investing is popular is because it generates fees um and so that is in the advisor's best interest perhaps not necessarily in in the investor's best interest um so part of it is actually how is a having a long talk with yourself about how active you want to be. Um, you know, I, kn- I know there are many listeners who spend a lot of time devouring what their next investment will be. But for many people who don't find investing to be um, 
a fun activity. Realizing that and putting yourself into more passive investments that do the right thing. So, you know, I think target date funds may be the best thing ever invented for many people um, because we know people don't rebalance and they should. So I, I'm a big fan of, of, of letting and some of my money, for example, are investments where people do the right thing for me. Right. You know, they rebalance automatically. Right. Um, they do tax loss harvesting when it's appropriate. Um, I'm willing to pay them something to do that because it, ha it has positive returns to my investments. Our final question for you, Eric. How do you define success in your life? You know, I feel I've been very successful and very lucky because I'm doing a bunch of things that make me very happy doing them. I enjoy them on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be research, teaching, consulting. Um, I'm just having a great time. And so I think that's how I define success, doing something you really enjoy and you know, being comfortable doing that. Well, this has been a great time. And I must say, I wish I was in your class tonight. <laughs> I would love to be studying this in school. So, Eric, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. You guys have really a, a great show and great questions. So it was wonderful being with you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks.